Hello everyone. Welcome to the 7th episode of the Women Startup Leader Series. In this episode, we have Nashaba Salauddin as speaker and Nisha Rahman, CEO of Bangladesh Angels as moderator. So Ms. Noshaba Salahuddin is the director, head of PR and communications at Zilingo, the largest B2B e-commerce ecosystem in Southeast Asia and South Asia, having raised $308 million in funding till date. She is a communication specialist and has worked across a spectrum of companies ranging from multinationals to startups. Prior to Zilingo, she has been with Alibaba, the World Bank, and Marriott International, with experience spanning international markets and sectors including development, finance, uh, fi- finance, technology, and media. Her highly adaptable nature, coupled with a strong understanding of global markets, makes her an ideal leader with the foresight to predict industry trends and devise communication strategies. At Zilingo, she has built the communications function from an in-house press office of one person to a high-performance team of 11 globally. Her PR strategy for the brand and its spokespeople has advanced Zilingo's value proposition as an industry leader and landed its founders coveted features as well as an inf- on influential lists such as Forbes 30 under 30, 40 under 40, and Bloomberg icons. She's also pursuing executive education at the University of Cambridge on sustainable strategies. So for today, you know, we'll focus our conversation on three parts. First, just to kind of get to know her a little bit, her background and, and an overview of Zilingo as well as a company. Uh, a deep dive more into her role and, and her team's role and reflections on the regional ecosystem and lessons learned, particularly for Bangladeshi startups and Bangladeshi founders and uh, aspiring, I think, uh, you know, startup executives like her. Uh, but Noshaba, uh, thank you so much for uh, being with us. Thank you for joining Bangladesh Angels today. Thank you so much, Nirjar, especially for that very kind introduction. And just want to take a couple of seconds to give kudos to you and your team for um, the commendable work that you're doing and the initiative that you guys have taken to invest in the community, uh, the people to enable entrepreneurship for the industry. You're very kind. We're, we're, we're trying to get started, but uh, hopefully with the help of people like you, uh, we'll, we'll get there. But thank you so much. Uh, so, yeah, we'll, but we'll go ahead and get started. And, and the first question, you know, just to kind of contextualize for those who are not you know, familiar with your story, you know, where did you grow up and, and how did you end up uh, at, at startups and particularly at Zilingo? Great. Happy to go back to basics. So um, born and raised in Bangladesh, I have grown up between Dhaka and New York. So after my A-levels, I moved to New York um, to pursue my undergrad. I did my undergrad in sociology and psychology. Um, and then I moved back home, and which is Dhaka, and then pursued my career in PR across different sectors, like you mentioned, uh, in the middle I was a consultant for the World Bank where I was working with their South Asia social protection team to help put policies in place for um, violence against women and women's economic empowerment. And that really got me thinking into how I can get more involved in the development sector. So I decided to pursue my master's in development studies, um, specifically in management and practice. Um, But funnily enough, I didn't go back to the sector uh, right after that, but got introduced to uh, the tech world and startup um, and quickly realized that I had to unlearn um, everything that I knew, having worked historically for legacy brands and organizations which are structured to the point of um, pedantic, you know, it's nothing like how you have to work at a, you know, a small startup. Um, And while I was doing uh, that, I was also working um, as um, uh, a news correspondent and editor for a TV channel, and um, which is very, very exciting till date. I'll say it's still been the most exciting job that I've ever had. And at some point I wanna go back to it. Um, Fast forward, moved to Singapore. Um, Zilingo happened where I look after, um, I'm responsible for building their global communication strategy, which comprises both internal and external. And, um, you know, managing a team spread across um, Asia. So packed schedule. 
I can imagine, but uh, in some ways, you know, it, it doesn't seem like a straight line, you know, from from development to you know what you're doing currently at startups. But on the other hand, it kind of I, I can see the motivation still, right? Because you know it is a sector that uh, you know, particularly textiles, you know, touches on so many facets of female empowerment throughout the value chain. So that I could kind of see the you know how you kind of getting, came to be involved. Uh, for those, you know. A lot of us might be familiar with Zilingo, at least based on the great PR work that you and your team are doing. Uh, but for those who are not as familiar, you know, could you explain to us a little bit more about what the company does and its mission and its vision? Happy to. Um, so Zilingo um, is a B2B tech platform with the vision of enabling the global supply chain to become fair, um, connected and transparent, which you know, all three factors lead to efficiency. Um, we offer businesses access to technology, financing, marketing and production solutions to help optimize production timelines and um, aggregate demand. It was um, founded in 2015 with a vision to put responsible and efficient business within everyone's reach. Um, so, you know, over the years, it has evolved into an end to end supply chain enabler that gives brands, wholesalers, distributors, retailers, and factories access to trade, financing, and logistics all on one platform. Excellent. So, we, we kind of see the three buckets or the streams of Zilingo, right? So, there's the trade part. I guess, which is focused on sellers or merchants. There's the factory part, which is focused on digitizing at the factory level. And then there's the, the connect part as well. Um, and, and could you tell us, you know, where does Bangladesh kind of fit within uh, the operations of Zilingo? I know you, you've got clients in the country. You're also working with suppliers, but could you tell us a little bit more about what you guys do in Bangladesh? Sure, uh, but a little bit of a disclaimer. I think some of our BD team has, has joined the session. So if I mess this up, Please, like, don't hold me accountable. Just chalk it up to being a little bit nervous. Um, so having said that, Zilingo has been operational in Bangladesh since 2019 with a um, growing active presence till date. Z Factory, which is our software as a service, and Z Trade are running alive with notable groups like Metro Knitting and Dying, Urmi Group, Microfiber, Deco Isho, Dressman, TRZ, On On The Apparel, to name a few. Um, but I'm also happy to announce that our BD arm is undergoing the registration process to fully operate as a foreign owned private um, entity. And the establishment of Zilingo BD as an entity in Bangladesh uh, significantly helps create trust in the domestic market and further um, enabled a strong platform to conduct business here in Bangladesh, keeping the garment industry's requirements in mind, um, along with, uh, you know, moving in to the Bangladesh government, moving within the Bangladesh government's mandate for digital Bangladesh and uh, with industry digitization, um, not to mention the creation of jobs and sustainable innovations uh, in the market. So I could go a little bit deeper in how we're checking the boxes for our digital Bangladesh economy uh, and keep and, you know, staying aligned with the ESG goals, but uh, I'll wait for you to ask me that. Not a problem, but but yeah, that's I think that's a great overview on kind of you know what Zilingo is doing, particularly when it comes to a value chain. I think kind of taking a deeper dive in, into your function and, and your team's function. So you know uh, your work kind of encompasses internal comms, obviously social media, media relations, crisis and reputation management. You know, could you give us at, at a high level how all of those kind of buckets, you know, more about those buckets and and how do they align? I, I think on and and what are, what do they look like from a day to day perspective for you? Absolutely. Um, so on a day to day, my job is what you'd call um, organized chaos. And to really emphasize the fact uh, to founders and C-suite of startups and tech startups and also like, you know, businesses that are starting out, uh, communications need you know, it needs to be identified as a core function, not a support function. So the earlier you invest in it, uh, the better it is for your brand and uh, your image. Um, so like I mentioned, I, um, I look after internal and external comms and that involves um, obviously social media, content marketing, PR, media relations, stakeholder management, crisis management. Um, so, you know, for me, it's very important to know what is going on around us and what the trending topics are, uh, are. So I wake up and I read every piece of news that I can find, everything that I subscribe to, from the New York Times to Bloomberg to FT to every like tech journal out there to LinkedIn blogs. Um, especially now when like we live in a knowledge economy, 
and the way people consume information is mostly through social media. Uh, understanding these trends and knowing what news your target audience is reading and how they're consuming it is very, very important. You may think that having a marquee publication publish your news is the greatest thing ever, but it's so short lived and it's, you know, it's quite navel gazing. Um, you have to understand, um, you know, for, especially for a B2B platform like us, we, we try to make sure we understand how our customers are consuming their news. What are they reading? What are they listening to? What are the avenues that they trust? And usually these are tra trade publications. So you have to go vernacular. You have to make sure you do your research on um, the journalists and the publications that you're pitching to. Um, you know, uh, a word of caution to PR people out there, please don't do a mass pitch to everybody on your contact list. Journalists don't appreciate that. Do your research on what they write about. And if that's relevant to the story that you're pitching, always, always add data. Uh, send content like videos and images and infographics because it makes their life easier. Always make sure you're highlighting the problem statement you're solving for and, you know, break it up into different types of messages and figure out which message is applicable to which delivery channel and do cross distribution. Um, make sure you're tying up with content marketing. Um, you know, it goes a long way to gain trust uh, and loyalty, you know, set yourself apart, M make yourself a trusted source of information, uh, you know, because good PR is very qualitative. So it's hard to gauge um, your, you know, ROI or your um, like su success metrics. So make sure you sit down with your internal stakeholders who are invested in your function to set very um, specific goals according to your like KPIs and OKRs according to your goals. Um, so I'm, we've got a lot of um, we've got a lot of founders in the in the room with us, right? And um, in, in the early days of a startup, um, the, the PR person might actually end up being one of the founders or the founder in, in terms of the CEO. Um, and so just, you know, for you know, obviously, obviously you guys are at a, you know, uh, a large uh, scale, but um, in terms of any specific, you know, advice you could give them, partic uh, particularly when it comes to, you know, what sort of cost-effective PR strategies they can employ. And also, you know, where, what is that kind of, uh, what is the relationship between marketing and PR, particularly in the early days of, you know, startups? Sure. So having worked at um, a startup in Bangladesh, which is Daraz, when, when I worked there, there was no budget. And usually with small startups, there is no budget in PR because they don't think it's, um, you know, when they don't see an ROI, they don't feel like it's uh, worth investing in. But um, it's not. I mean, it is the, the, the thread that connects your brand and your image uh, with the external audience. So if you're a founder who, I mean, founders are usually very, very hands-on when it comes to PR and communications for the company. Uh, like for myself, I report to the CEO and co-founder of my company and she's very, very hands-on and involved. Um, you need to be very scrappy. Uh, so talk to everybody. Um, really, really nail down what your when you're starting out, what your growth, what your founding story is, because people want to know how you got started, what motivated you. Uh, that's kind of how we led our PR strategy through the founder stories, which is very, very powerful. So don't think that this is not important because what you may just gloss over, because usually we're our biggest critic, somebody might think is like the hook to a big story. So really build on your story and your journey and then uh, at the same time, nail down your USBs and what your value proposition is. You know, creating a message house around your USBs is very, very important. Make sure you drive that in with your, uh, your internal audience, which is your employees, which is your biggest brand equity. I mean, they're gonna be your biggest advocate. And sometimes we don't even, uh, you know, we don't even sort of take that into account and we miss out this whole segment of people who could be your ambassador. So please recognize that if, you know, I would say that if you're communicating through emails, then have 
redirects attached to your signatures. Make sure all your social media handles are always updated and they're plugged into your email signatures. Make sure your, your LinkedIn profiles are always updated. Make sure you follow people and companies you aspire to be. But very importantly, do not underestimate the power of following and subscribing to what your competition is doing. Um, that's a hack that a lot of people, I think, feel like the ego gets in the way. Like, why should I follow what my competition is doing? But it's very, very important because it, you know, keeps you ahead of the curve. You know, think conscientiously about sort of, you know, where you, you know, the channels you place yourself, uh, you know, contextualize whenever you're reaching out to these influencers, including obviously journalists and media people, et cetera, and, and think very hard and uh, about your story. And, and obviously that could be a huge source of differentiation. And I, I was just, th I was, it's funny because I'm thinking about it, you know, every time I read about Zillingo, uh, you guys are obviously a very well-known entity now, but even now, you know, I, I feel like, you know, every other article I come across, uh, especially in researching for this, it's all about that founder story of Ankiti you know, being in Jatujak market in Bangkok over a weekend, you know, seeing a lot of, found, you know, these uh, sellers that had really great um, items, but they didn't necessarily have an ability to reach an audience beyond, you know, that particular kind of footfall, right? Um, so I always thought, you know, that that resonated with me. And I think that makes a lot of sense when it comes to, you know, really focusing on the founder story. Um, so yeah, no, I think then I just want to kind of take a step back, right? And, and you know, go more, I guess, um, think a little bit more kind of from a tactical standpoint. And so for, for you guys, uh, and obviously for founders as well, you know, what are some channels uh, that are used to kind of push out PR um, or I don't know if that's the right word. And, and how do you measure their effectiveness? Going back to that question of ROI. Sure. So um, social media is huge, obviously. Uh, so make sure you are um, utilizing and amplifying your news on every channel where you feel like your target audience and your media connections are plugged into. But always please make sure that you are packaging your information that is uh, going to be relevant for that medium. Uh, this one size fits all doesn't work. You have to make sure you are creating bespoke messages in content that is going to resonate with your target audience. So understand what your pain points are and highlight the problem statement you're, you're solving. But I always follow the KISS rule, K-I-S-S, like keep it simple, stupid. No one wants to have to figure out what you're trying to say. So do not talk in circles. Do not be long-winded. Do not like give a journalist a riddle to like figure out. Nobody has the time. Journalists are getting like 100 pitches a day. So um, another trick that we always use is that when journalists, you know, see your email and before they open it, they can see the subject line. Uh, so make sure what you're trying to pitch to them is very clear in your subject line uh, itself and that it prompts them to open it. Relationship building is very important. And that goes to, for founders as well. Uh, please do your research on uh, the, the uh, mediums that, talks about the news of your industry, connect with those journalists. Don't just look for the gold standard or the marquee publication because uh, in a, a lot of times, especially for B2B, you have to go very local. You have to be very vernacular. So don't ignore the trade publications. Don't ignore the small guys. Um, speak in the language that your media landscape understands. What I do in Singapore or US might not resonate with the Bangladesh media. So understand their love language, to put it very bluntly. Um, so tie up uh, your PR messaging with content marketing. Uh, we do regular cadence with our digital marketing team uh, because, you know, having uh, data to understand where the gaps are it's very very important uh, we do use um, some measurement uh, we have some measurement tools uh, and resources that we use uh, i don't know if they're applicable in bangladesh but we use uh, meltwater which helps us track our news and our performance our share of voice um, our abe and we also use uh, social bakers for social media um, so yeah, that's um, a couple of ways I could say that is a good way to sort of use as a jump off point. And, and it, you know, going back to that question of cadence, you know, or just kind of thinking, uh, you know, what sort of cycles do you guys operate on? Is it, you know, every week you're trying to distribute certain stories or work on a certain storyline or is it monthly, is it quarterly? 
Um, okay, so given how, um, you know, it's a very fast paced uh, environment, you also have to stay very agile and nimble when it comes to your um, aligning yourself with the objectives and priorities of the business. So we have regular cadence with the leadership team, uh, which includes uh, business leads as well every two weeks. Uh, they update us on their immediate priorities, whether it's product launches, whether it's a loyalty program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then we give them a, a checklist of things that we need covered and answered so that we can create a strategy and messaging around that. Um, so the, the central and core messaging comes from the headquarter, but we obviously have uh, different teams in different markets. Um, the, the, you know, the country specific teams take that um, information and they use that as a wireframe to tweak and localize it for what the country specific objectives are and um, uh, what, the, what those distribution channels may be. Got it. And another question, you know, so you, you talked about trade publications, you know, Zilingo is primarily a B2B platform uh, that might work with B2C brands, but, you know, working on the B2B side, uh, how is, you know, and, but you worked also in, in the e-commerce side that was very much B2B, B2C. So just curious, you know, how does it differ, I guess, you know, what, what, how does it differ from a channel standpoint? How does it differ from, let's say, a messaging standpoint when it comes to, say, you know, PR for the consumer or the mass market versus, say, B2B stakeholders? Sure. So, it's like, we always joke around, like especially PR people in the B2B sector that um, how do we make B2B sexy? Because it's not, because it's not facing the consumer. Um, so again, like B2C is very uh, consumer driven, uh, while B2B is very relational. Um, you have to highlight, you have to let the work speak for itself. You have to um, highlight your customer testimonials you have to engage with your customers you have to give them a platform to talk about their success stories that's going to instill trust and it's going to help with retention it's going to increase loyalty um for b2c i think it's you know a very much campaign related um and um, there's a lot of atl that goes in there you know you're catering to consumer behavior and a lot of that is driven through by, by emotion and prestige and desire and whim so you know it, i think it's a little bit more fast moving where b2b pr is more long term it's more strategic it can be in your face you know trust building and creating awareness um uh, with your customer base is most important. And so always engaging and knowing what their pain points are and how do you help that out uh, will go a long way. Uh, makes sense. Uh, when it comes to also, you know, for B2B uh, and particularly for a company like Zilingo, you know, could you tell us a little bit more about, you know, if you were to identify or map your main kind of stakeholders uh, and, and I guess, you know, what, you know, what, uh, what equation comes into, uh, comes into um, factor uh, when it comes to positioning uh, for those relevant groups? Sure. So yeah, stakeholder mapping is very important and you have to break it down between internal and exter external. Uh, for Zilingo, our, my, you know, the PR team's internal stakeholders are definitely um, leadership. It's uh, the employees, it's um, uh, HR, and it's uh, finance and operations. Uh, externally, it's uh, media relations, it's uh, our customers. Um, so you need to, first of all, with your internal stakeholders, you have to get their buy-in. You have to make sure they understand the impact of what the work that you're trying to do because if you're not able to measure impact then it didn't happen and like i mentioned pr is very qualitative so it's hard to quantify it so that's why having that conversation with the with your internal stakeholders is very important when you do set certain kpis and uh, okrs in place uh, and um Obviously, you know, you are using a bandwidth and resources when it comes to engaging with the other stakeholders like, you know, finance or operations or HR or marketing. Uh, so you need to create a co collaborative um, workflow and dynamic where they understand the 
the the big picture of why you're doing something. So explaining the why is not just important for your external audience. It's very, very vital for your internal audience too. You mentioned employees, and I thought that was quite interesting. I, I'd imagine for a fast growing company that's working across so many jurisdictions and also domains, you know, retaining, but also acquiring talent is important. Um, do you end, ever end up kind of do, you know, do, positioning some of your PR pieces or, you know, work on, on that side as well? Sure. So employer branding uh, tied in with internal communications, it's one of my biggest mandates. So uh, again, regular cadence with HR team is very, very important to make sure that you're not doubling down efforts and uh, on the same stuff and there's less overlap and you're using your resources efficiently. Um, so coming up with strategies, especially now when everybody's working remotely um, and again, the, the mental health uh, issues that get spiked by COVID, it's very, very important to make sure that you're always engaging with your employees, that they know that um, you, they are taken care of, that they, you know, that you're there for them. And so creating engagements, whether it's quiz nights or whether it's, you know, doing a masterclass where we bring somebody else from the outside to do a, a knowledge sharing session. So very recently we brought in the founder of Nerd Wallet. Uh, to give the women of Zilingo uh, um, a 101 on investing and why it's very important for women to start investing very early. So, you know, employees need to know that you're invested in their uh, well-being and their um, development as well. So we're always making sure that we're people first and um, keeping communication um, very regular, especially with remote teams, especially when with this hybrid uh, work situation, um, communicating every little win and celebrating every little win becomes very important. So we have a newsletter which goes out once a month. We have a, a kudos channel where we appreciate and mention and celebrate every little, you know, like, you know, milestone or win. Um, so uh, these are just some of the little things uh, that we're doing. We also have um, uh, a helpline in place uh, for a COVID helpline for people who have been impacted or the families have been impacted by that. We're providing uh, free professional counseling to anybody who needs it um, because we're all being affected by this pandemic in one way or the other. And um, so just, you know, giving people an avenue where they're able to uh, figure out how to process this or even acknowledge the fact that this is happening has been a uh, top of mind for us. And thank you for that. Uh, another group, obviously, you know, you mentioned is kind of media relations and I think you also talked about obviously journalists and contextualizing for them. Uh, and just curious, you know, like, yeah, you're right. Like, you know, journalists are getting hit up for stories all the time. So a lot of things they could be writing about, I'm sure they're under a lot of pressure, but how do you build that kind of symbiotic relationship between, you know, your network of journalists and, and, and a fast growing company that, you know, you're trying to kind of get your message across? Sure. So um, for Singapore, the media is very friendly and very helpful and it's easy for us to do like, or it was to do like coffee meetups, et cetera. But now you, you know, journalists also know that that's not possible. So don't always have an ulterior motive to connect with another human being uh, because that's who they are. So checking in on them, you know, sending them interesting articles that you think they might find uh, helpful in, in the beat that they are working towards. And when things do open up and it's a safer situation for people to meet up. So do those coffee chats, do those meetups, you know, do it virtually. Uh, so that is very important um, because, you know, relationship building and every really relationship with journalists has become very relational. So um, again, just make sure that when you're sending them stuff, you do it in a way where you've already done have the work for them and they don't have to, you're not just adding to what they might have to do when you're sending them a pitch. You might have an excellent pitch about an amazing product launch, but they might just gloss over it because of the way you presented it. Also, don't hound people. You know, some people have incessant uh, habits of just like following up every day or like calling or messaging email. No, don't be, don't be a pest. Uh, be, be an asset. 
So, you know, give them some time because everybody is working with lean teams and everybody's working on deadlines uh, and let them know that they're there, uh, that you're there for whenever they're ready to speak. And if it doesn't work out this time, you're happy to like, you know, uh, discuss something that they might be working on themselves to see if there's any synergy. I like that. I, I almost feel like those are great sales lessons or sales <laughs> principles as well. Isn't that to be an asset, not a pest? I love that. Uh, <laughs> and I hope we were we were an asset to you uh, because we were bothering you quite a bit as well to get on this. So, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, another. Um, I know some of your team members are on the line as well. Uh, so this is also curious. You know, like for us, you know, we're we're small, but we've got people in Europe. We got people in Bangladesh. I'm in the U.S. at the moment, but yeah, how do you, um, especially in times like this, right? Like, how do you manage a multinational team across so many time zones? You know, what are what are some things personally for you? You know, whether it's platforms or tactics that have helped to kind of do it, um, especially when you're doing it digitally. Uh, yeah, you know, I love that question because sometimes I think I can, when I say it out loud, it feels like I'm really like you know really doing something very impactful. Um, but we have, you know, country heads and specialists uh, in our teams that take care of country specific norms and regulations. So while the core strategy, like I mentioned in buying comes from the HQ, um, the, the country specific teams use it as a wireframe to tweak it accordingly, you know? Um, so I connect with them on a regular basis on their monthly quarterly deliverables and help set these uh, KPIs accordingly, uh, as well as regular cadence. Um, you know, so you, you know, you, you have to also spend time to understand progress, challenges, and growth. Um, it's crucial that you set clear goals aligned with business priorities and make sure, like I specifically always try to make sure that me and my team consistently approach work in alignment with those and the company culture. Um, so as we work across time zones, we're not rigid with like login and log out time. And we, you know, the work situation is extremely flexible. Um, and people work uh, as per their convenience. But regular communication is vital when you have remote teams, especially in a fast paced environment. So it also helps uh, if you set and manage uh, expectations accordingly with regular communication. Um, you also need to empower your team to be able to make decisions and trust their instinct. You know, I don't believe in micromanaging. Like I always tell my team that I didn't hire you for your stamina. I hired you for your ideas and strategy. Um, so regular temperature checks are very important. I, as a manager, are extremely invested in the well-being of my team. I, I will just set up calls with them and not even talk about work and just find out how they're doing, how their families are doing, if they're doing something exciting, sending them like funny stuff that I might read or listen to and be like, hey, I think this might be interesting for you. Um, and I do like a lot of random reading listening to stuff uh so sometimes I'll, I'll be a little bit overzealous and be like i know i gave you a deadline but here's something that i think you should take five minutes and read about excuse me but when i say my team it shouldn't only be limited to your team because in pr and com especially for somebody like me who was so closely connected to the ceo um you also are always on a daily basis acting as a as a counsel for them so uh, you know bridging that gap between the external um the external image of the of the company with the vision and mission of the company and and keeping everybody on the street and narrow and you know driving these uh objectives on a daily basis um is also part of my job so i guess i'm straddling uh, the very you know getting the work done but also uh hey i watched this on netflix what did you think um that's kind of you know what i how i manage my teams or who i am as a person uh, and a manager and, and it's part of the culture and the tone that you set right uh, which is very vital as well um you know so you, you know going back to that kind of thread of bridging the external and internal and also going back you know Sometimes you get to be very strategic and very deliberate, and sometimes crises happen, like COVID or other things, and you don't get to do that. And so, could you give us some example, maybe COVID being one, or maybe others where you've had to kind of step in and, and do crisis management, and, and how does that work from a PR standpoint? 
Uh, sure. Uh, I mean, I feel like because of COVID, every comms person had to uh, learn and reinvent how to do communications and PR strategies because it's like uncharted territories. You know, I've, I'm like in the wild, wild west over here. So um, it's um, especially with, you know, with COVID and people going through restructuring and laying people off and going into leaner teams. Um, I would say when it comes to handling crisis, uh, crisis management and change management is very important. So one from the PR perspective would be handling media, right? Um, very bluntly, don't bullshit the media. Don't lie uh, a bit and so that you don't have to worry about being caught in the lie. Be upfront, take accountability um, for what has happened um, and, uh, you know, control the narrative, get your message out there and set the record straight so that there's no room for speculation. Um, that's very, very important when it comes to talking to the media. Make sure your spokespeople are media trained. Please invest in that. Um, and know what you are have to say and know even more so what you shouldn't say, but stick to the truth. Um, and for your internal audience, you need to make sure that they know what the goal of the company is. They know what your future plans are. They know uh, why you did uh, and wh why you're doing what you're doing. So as long as you communicate and keep them in the loop, uh, people are much more receptive. They're much more accepting and they're much more forgiving. Uh, and, and thank you for that. Uh, and, you know, while we were kind of speaking and uh, a few questions came up uh, along the lines of, you know, one, you know, startups don't have a big amount of budget. Uh, once again, you know, how do they do PR? How do they think about PR? So, and, and particularly, I want to sp uh, focus on a couple points, right? So one is, you know, I mean, how do you build like in the early days um, of a startup once again, when you're just trying to get out there, when you yourself are having to figure out your product market fit, how do you build trust and credibility, right? Uh, when you may not have that uh, based on the track record that you have, uh, would you have any advice for founders? Sure, tons, but I'll stick to you a couple. Um, founders, please make sure that you are, um, very updated when it comes to all your public profiles, especially LinkedIn. Um, and not only with the company that you're trying to create, but with your vision and mission and how it all comes back to you giving back to the society, because, you know, we're all trying to create a value for the world, like, you know, for the, the environment or social or government or, you know, whatever it is. So make sure your value proposition is very, very clear. And it can change over time, especially with startups, right? Because we're constantly like either pivoting or evolving. So that is okay. Just because you said something now doesn't mean it. you can't change or tweak it for, you know, if your priorities shift in the, in the future, but be very clear about why, because when we were going through our um, B2B transition from like a B2C, it was like working from a com for a completely different company, but you have to explain, you know, the value that you're providing. And also for founder founders, please all, uh, engage in conversations over whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook or you know, whatever the medium is that you know your target audience is, is um, uh, engaging with. Um, engage in conversations and blogs and posts where you know that the, these industry uh, in, in, discussions are being held. Um, follow these people, reach out to them directly over LinkedIn, um, schedule a meeting. Uh, you know, as busy as people are, uh, as human beings, we're always trying to help people out, and especially um, given how COVID has impacted everybody. I think we're all trying to be there for each other. So don't be shy about uh, networking. And the only Stupid questions are the ones that you don't ask. So, you know, raise your hand and ask for help and be like, you know, I'm trying to do this and I know you've done it. So can you please tell me what were your um, 
what were your uh, challenges so I can learn from them? You know, um, you don't have to go out there and be like, hey, please, you know, I want, want you to be my mentor. Uh, that's putting a lot of pressure on the other person. But build on these relationships uh, and, and, you know, like especially with people that you uh, aspire to be like or have they've created change that you also want to create along those footsteps so really be active on uh, all your like your digital footprint has to be updated it has to be active um and feature all like your company wins whether it's internal wins whether it's you know you're saying uh, congratulations to a junior associate because he just got confirmed for a position after three months of probation every little bit is uh a reflection of who you are as a leader and you know what kind of culture you're trying to build so um uh, you know that's one advice that i'll say that you know please be very very active and and leave your your dna over your digital footprint right so you know lots of startups don't yet see the value of pr because of the la a lack of direct roi as you rightly said earlier um in, in particular, you know, how do you then kind of quantify the work you're doing, especially in relation to the funding you're receiving? Because I'd imagine, and I'm sure I, I, I was in that, if I were to see a bucket for PR and, and a company's pitching for it um, as part of their budget, it's it, it, well, it raised some questions about whether or not this is worth it. And so, you know, how do you kind of, I guess, you know, with funders or investors, you know, how do you kind of play, um, how do you, uh, you know, make the point or the argument for investing in PR, even at the early days of the startup? I mean, especially in the early days, what is your major goal? Is it creating awareness? Is it um, instilling trust? Is it educating people about the uh, industry you're trying to help? So you really need to figure out, you know, what your, again, like we're all in business to create, to solve a problem, right? So how, like the PR is a distribution channel. So if media knowing what you are doing as a company is going to help you um, gain market share. It's going to help you build trust and credibility. Um, how do you propose you do that? PR is not just you taking a picture of a signing ceremony and putting it out for God knows where it's going to get picked up. You need to be able to track it. So you're putting up a billboard, uh, but how are you tracking uh, how many people are looking at it or what the redirect is, right? So putting in these, you know, measurement metrics and tracking metrics are very, very uh, important. So then again, you need to you need to talk to your team and you need to talk to management about what do they want to achieve and do they really understand the the depth of what PR can achieve for a company and its immediate objective. So have that honest conversation. It's not just, oh my God, like now I have to put money aside for PR, but really understand the value it's going to create for you. Because if you are not sold on it, you can't, your PR person is not going to be able to sell it to somebody else. Makes sense. Um, another, uh, there were a few questions on this evolving media scene, right? And you, I mean, you have this really interesting vantage point because you worked in Bangladesh, you were in the media industry there as well. Uh, you know, obviously digital media is dominant, TV is still important, but maybe less so. Obviously trade publications, maybe, you know, certain industries, it's still a little bit nascent. Uh, but we have, between those three, you know, what are, you know, what would you, I mean, does it make sense for a startup, for example, to founder to focus on, let's say, TV appearances, getting in, getting news stories out there, um, as opposed to just focusing uh, exclusively on social media, for example, would you have some advice on that? All of it. If you're getting an opportunity, take it. Um, especially now when news is out there forever and with, especially with the 24 hour news cycle, um, use every avenue, you know, and especially in Bangladesh where your network is such a, a, a vital uh, part of how you do PR, um, really uh, capitalize on that. Call up that friend, you know, works at a radio station or call up that friend who, whose dad owns a, a newspaper company um, you know, a, a friend who's starting out with a podcast, like you never know where you're going to find your next demo. So all explore all avenues, don't turn down any opportunity, especially in the early days. Um, and at the same time, yes, social media is an e-hack. 
and you know you get instant gratification you know who you're communicating with you can get your engagement rate um etc cetera, etc cetera. you can also you have more control over uh how you pace out the information going back to that point right so this is an interesting question from uh, so in bangladesh pr is still largely seen as a support function while social media marketing most often takes the lead um, in the digital area, how do you differentiate between social media marketing and PR, both in Bangladesh and, and maybe in Singapore as well? I mean, they're all intertwined, right? Um, so I don't think there's any reason to try to segregate because they all feed off of each other. Um, PR is earned. Um, if you're paying for PR, um, then it's a very short shelf life and you lose credibility. But I understand in Bangladesh, um, you know, there are certain um, ways of doing PR, which might involve, uh, uh, you know, some uh, financial involvement. Uh, so, you know, like figure out the way PR works for your country. Uh, it doesn't work like that uh, in Singapore. Uh, but um, at, the, at the same time, um, for example, if uh, marketing is highlighting a campaign or promoting discounts, um, then PR is there to talk about uh, the success story. And, um, you know, it's about storytelling. It's about highlighting what you did and how many people it affected or how it raised your, uh, your margin or, you know, the, the, it, it's there to highlight your success metrics. Um, and in turn, it uh, creates a brand image and reputation for your company. So if you are just okay with doing a marketing campaign and putting billboards out there or you know, doing like a Facebook Live or um, whatever it may be, uh, affiliate marketing, this, that, but how are you talking about the success of your business or what your who you are as as an entity, um, what your vision and mission is, right? You know that story needs to be told, and how do you do that? Uh, so you can take out a, a one page ad and promote your products, but nobody wants to be told what they should and shouldn't buy. People want to be understood. Uh, their pain points need to be understood. So you need to tie in. PR with social media, with content marketing, and uh, and really speak to how you're solving these problems for your target audience. Makes sense. I, I like. The, I mean, you have to invest as much in own media and, and paid media as well as earned earn media, right? Like it, it all kind of ties in together um, as part of a coherent whole. Um, so I like that very much. Um, you know, we've got a few minutes left, so I do want to kind of move into reflections a little bit. Um, so one question is um, you know can PR be used for the greater good, whether it's global goals like sustainability and ESG and, and trends or national goals like say, you know, the context of Bangladesh, digital Bangladesh and industry 4.0? Sure, um, I love that question. So again, you know, like I said, we live in a knowledge eco economy, right? Uh, whereas even say five years ago, sustainability and ESG, they were like nice to haves and they were just buzzwords. But at the rate we are using up our natural resources and they're getting depleted, um, we need to start reconsidering the take, make, and dispose model and really think about the, the cradle to cradle model. Like, how do we um, stop buying and maybe rent more, maybe keep products in use longer, reuse, repurpose, recycle? Um, so it's it's all about how you can connect your business model with um, the principles of a circular economy, especially with um, tech specific companies, you're already checking a lot of the boxes, because uh, you are essentially um, taking people online and um, increasing efficiency, you're saving time, you're, it's more transparent, you can track it better. Um, so digitization is a huge pillar when it comes to uh, the, you know, sustainable development goals. So what I will say for, especially for um, tech companies is that spend some time in doing an exercise where you identify how your business model enables and contributes to uh, a circular economy. 
and highlight those. Uh, and you'll see, and sometimes more often than not, you are already aligned with so many of the uh, SDGs and circular economy principles. And that's, that's, you know, that sets you apart and that creates amazing employer branding. It, um, it creates uh, a sense of belonging to a, a greater goal. Uh, you're paying it forward. And um, especially with uh, Gen Z and millennials um, who are more invested in uh, the value of what you're doing more so than uh, the, the performance of something, uh, you really need to uh, be conscious and conscientious of how you're giving back to the people planet. And at the same time, how implementing these uh, measures are helping you save um, money. It's helping you save time. So it's not like, oh, we're investing a lot to be to, to have sustainable innovations and create more sustainable practices. No, in fact, it's there to save you money. So please highlight these things to your customers. And, um, you know, the second you tell somebody this is going to save you money and time, you've, you've closed that deal. Another one, I mean, this might be, this might be a webinar in and of itself, uh, but you know, you mentioned kind of working directly with the CEO and, and I think Ankiti is, is just a fascinating uh, person. You know, I think if I remember correctly from one of the articles that she is the first kind of South Asian or Indian origin woman to lead us a, uh, a unicorn, a founding lead a unicorn, uh, which I think is great. And we'd love to get a Bangladeshi, Bangladeshi woman at some point um, in that list as well. But, uh, but yeah, what are some lessons you might've uh, learned, you know, working very closely with her? Sure. So funnily enough, Ankiti's family is from Bangladesh and she's fluent in Bangla. Um, so that's just an added perk. Um, uh, again, you know, I feel like for women and as women, we need more role models. We need to highlight and amplify more females in leadership positions and really break the stigma that women are just fit for certain roles or success means you there, there is an opportunity cost of um, how you are as a mother or a wife or a daughter or a daughter-in-law. Um, at the same time, you know, for us, it's very important, especially as women that look for those role models and they can come from men as well, you know. So, you know, raise your hand and, and ask for help and, and women need to back women more, I feel. There's no reason, like there's enough room for everybody. So there's no reason to get insecure about somebody else's success. Um, in fact, um, you should just, I mean, when you highlight somebody else's success, I think you're creating good karma for yourself and not to get too philosophical. But again, you know, practice, like, like practice what you preach and, pre and preach with action. And um, don't be afraid of uh, taking a, a leap and don't be afraid of doing something different and new. Uh, I have had no formal training in PR or communications. I learned on the job. Uh, so, you know, take a lot of, you know, people are iffy about joining tech companies, especially in Bangladesh, because it's still at infancy. Uh, but, you know, it's the future. So I feel like, you know, you should hit the ground running and really expand your horizon. And there, you know, if you already know something about a role or a job, then what are you going to learn? Like, where's your, with the learning curve and that? So really like throw yourself in there and you'll figure it out. And mistakes are there so you can learn from them and do it better. Um, but, you know, that would be my advice that, you know, take up challenges. Uh, don't be afraid of speaking up. Trust your instinct. Don't, as women, I feel like we get shy about expressing dissent, even when we know that they're right. Uh, we occupy less physical space if when we're in a, say, meeting with men. Uh, we kind of put ourselves on the back burner. And I'm not saying this is a sweeping statement, but it's true for a lot of people. And I've been uh, guilty of that too. Um, but just know that, you know, like you, you just need to, you need to be confident. You need to know that, that you, you I mean, this sounds a little bit pedantic, but Women are is the 50% of like the population. So we're just missing out on 
uh, contributing to the economy in such a huge way. So we should definitely generate more confidence in uh, women and females, especially from a in- younger age. And we shouldn't be pushing everybody to become like a doctor, an engineer, especially when uh, this is a digital economy. I-, I like that a lot because, you know, that, that was kind of the motivations behind doing this webinar and, and podcast series, right, is, is to highlight more women startup leaders, um, particularly of Bangladeshi origin, uh, and kind of contribute to that um, as ban, as Bangladeshi angels. Uh, you know, can't thank you enough. Uh, really appreciate the the time you gave us today and, and looking forward to more collaborations in the future. And uh, but, but thank you so much uh, for, uh, for, for joining us today at BAN. It has been my pleasure. And again, I feel like there should be more platforms like yours where you do give women avenues to speak and connect and learn from. Uh, so if you if there's anybody in your network who would love to connect, I'm happy to consult um on pr for anybody who needs it it's my passion i love doing it so feel free to connect them to me and like i said anybody can reach out and connect with me on linkedin and i'm really proud for all you know for the work that bangladesh angels is doing and it's been my pleasure and i'm so humbled that i was included um with you know in your work and i appreciate it a lot Watch out. Uh, we'll take you up on that. So, so thank you for that offer. And uh, <laughs> we're humbled that you joined us today as well. Thank you so much for your time. You're most welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for your time as well.